you for that very generous uh, introduction. And I, I just want to, um, again, thank uh, Dr. Uh, Rora Baldessari, who has done so much to create uh, this universality program. It is extraordinary. So I, she and, and others who have worked with her, it, it's, a, it's a brand new concept. It's something that doesn't exist in any other area. So let's give her another round. Dr. Wang's uh, comments and Mr. Bedron and Professor uh, Carlo Davoli. We're delighted to have you, uh, Davoli, excuse me, uh, to have you with us today. We're all here because we are certainly friends of Italian culture. And I don't know about you, but once upon a time, thank you, uh, once upon a time, Sputnik was the thrust into the space race for Americans. It was an opportunity to encourage young American students to study math and science, and I was one of those at the time. And I think we all know that American students have tended to lag behind other nations in their performance in mathematics and science areas. But there is a wonderful ray of hope. After 25 years, the United States Olympiad team, and by the way, this is a team that goes internationally to compete in very difficult mathematical programs. They're chosen uh, from the ones who win the United States Olympiad, and they go on, and this year, after more than 25 years, the American team won first place. Now, unfortunately, Dr. Wang has had to leave us, but an interesting note is that most of the students are of Asian heritage, mostly Chinese background, and there were no young, young women on the team this year. This ha there has only been one young woman who now is a professor of mathematics in California that has been on the team. And so there's been many, many efforts to encourage young women and people of color to study more mathematics. So fast forward to the buzzword today, STEM, which is seeking to do what certainly the thrust into the space race did back in the 50s and 60s. It continues to be a disproportionately small number of uh, women and uh, people of color in the fields of STEM, but many interventions are changing that, and certainly the universality curriculum will help in that regard. Teachers, as you know, at the elementary and secondary and collegiate level can enhance their programs in STEM by looking at the lesson plans in this curriculum. They're ready-made, they're free, and as Dr. Uh, uh, Baldessari has said, it is an opportunity to use these even on the website. So, now I don't want anybody to shudder at the word mathematics. I know it does send shivers up your, your spine every now and then, but really we're going to have just a little fun today. And we're going to look at some of the extraordinary ways in which a mathematician who was nicknamed Sfibonacci made an enormous difference. And I have to tell you that just moments ago before the Congress started, Dr. Andrea Baldi, who is from Rutgers University, informed me of a brand new, uh, uh, happening really, uh, a discovery on the walls of a church in Pisa that was going to, that was undergoing renovation and shows what is concerned, uh, considered to be the Fibonacci sequence. And stay tuned because there's going to be a lot more coming out. This is a brand new area. So uh, learning for all of you young people and all of us who are a little bit older, uh, and 99, going on 100. Uh, there's lots of lifelong learning and many new things. Mathematics is, is evolving, even though we feel that certain things still remain the same. This is a rendering of what uh, Leonardo Pisano Bigolo, now called Fibonacci, looked like. Very often he's known as Leonardo de Pisa. And although the dates he was alive are, uh, you know, a little sketchy, it's roughly the 21st, 12th century and into the 13th, and he had a, a rather long life according to uh, these years. He published the Fibonacci sequence of numbers that we will talk about today. He is indeed one of the most famous middle-aged mathematicians. 
And he also gave us our decimal system, the Hindu Arabic numbering system, which replaced the Roman numerical system. And that appears in his book, Liber Abaci. I want you to think about a particular number, 1.6180. Just keep it in mind, jot it down, we will come back to it. Now, <laughs> a little, I told you it'd be fun, didn't I? I just want you to look at what is an amazing set of simple numbers that we can all come up with, but thanks to Fibonacci. It is now called the Fibonacci sequence. And it start, in some books today, it will start with zero. That makes it a little bit easier. Uh, because each member of the sequence is the sum of the two predecessors. So for instance, if you thought of it as zero, zero and one gives you one. OK. Uh, and then it goes on to one and one gives you two. Two and one gives you three. Five and three, eight. Eight and five, 13, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, ad infinitum. That is the Fibonacci sequence. And what was amazing about it was that he determined that this sequence appears over and over and over in nature. And we'll talk a brief bit about it. And if you look at this diagram, this is very often the way that his sequence is depicted. And as I say, it just goes on and on, kind of like pi and e. What does this have to do with anything? Well, you know earlier, I did give you a pine cone. I brought mine. And um, it's a little bit hard to see, but if one were to look, I have to thank Jocelyn Barrios Gonzalez for doing this wonderful PowerPoint. If you were to look at the back of the pine cone, and again, some of you have little ones, it's a bit more difficult to, to find. But if you look as is shown in this diagram, at the spirals of the pine cone in the back, you will find that they will spiral this way, and they will spiral, spiral, pardon me, and spiral that way. And if you were to count them as they increase in their size, they follow the same pattern of the Fibonacci numbers, which is rather extraordinary. And he found that it also is true in pineapples, in the petals of roses, in the petals of sunflowers, in so many aspects in nature. And you know, mathematics is really the study of patterns. And it was extraordinary that he had the insight to examine so many aspects of nature and observe that the way in which nature puts forth its fruits and its pine cones and so many other areas are done according to that sequence. And if we had more time, of course, in a class, we would examine in a little more detail exactly how that happens. But when you think about it, it's really very, very extraordinary. Now, I want to go a step farther. And that is, if we go back to our sequence, if we were to take each number and divide it by the predecessor, it would be 1 over 1 would give you 1, 2 over 1 would give you 2, 3 over 2 would give you 1 and a half, um, and continue all the way along. You'll get numbers such as from 1 and a half, it would go to 1.666, then 1.6, then 1.625, then 1.61538. And it will tend to close in on the number 1.6. Remember that number? 1.6180 if you round it off. So what? What does that have to do with anything? Well, it was dubbed the golden ratio because it is really something that other cultures were aware of a long time before. In other words, it's the kind of perfect way that we see uh, people, body shapes, buildings, and even though the Egyptians were not aware of the Fibonacci sequence, they built the Great Pyramid of Giza 
and it came very close to those proportions. The base divided by the height was 1.5717. If you round it off, it's 1.6. So you can see that in an instinctive way, they were aware of that golden ratio. If you look at some of the statuary, the Greek uh, statues, they follow that same kind of bodily proportion. So I'm just going to look at one aspect of that in terms of the ratio and our human body. And I'm going to call up a volunteer um, from among our students. Is there somebody who would like to come up? This is not going to be hard. I promise. OK, come on. I'm looking. That's great. And I will tell you, I did this on myself, but we're going to try it on this young lady. We're going to look at the length from her elbow to her wrist. Okay, somebody write these numbers down. I could do that in my head. However, I will, and I'm sure the students would do this on their phones. I'm going to do this on my, uh, these are practically free these days, right? Everybody gives these away. So we're going to do 9.5. Anybody do this faster than I can? I, I certainly welcome it. What do you get? 1.46. Of course, you're still growing. So, <laughs> 1.46. Okay. Rounds off to 1.5. That's pretty close. Pretty close when you consider it. She's, she's very perfect. And uh, I tried myself. Okay. I am 11. Don't I wish? No, I'm 11 divided by 6.5. And, and I'm a little bigger. I come to 1.6923. My conclusion is, I am not a golden girl. <laughs> you are definitely on the way to being a golden girl. So I think if you do this in your class, try it. And uh, just from elbow to wrist, divided by wrist to the end of your middle finger. And see how close you come to 1.6180. And I would guarantee that most of you will be probably all of you will be in that ballpark. And that is exactly what the Greeks, the Romans, the Egyptians knew, but didn't realize that it was the Fibonacci sequence. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. So as I said earlier, it's all about patterns. Fibonacci knew so much, but he didn't have any kind of technical aspects of a calculator. He didn't have any of the uh, opportunities that we have today. So you can Im imagine that it was his own natural instinct, his own ability to observe patterns over and over and over and see that they repeated. And he was able to then bring that into a structure that as we see today is something that can be applied in our modern world. The beauty of the universality of, of Italian heritage curriculum is that it can bring alive so many of the discoveries of the past, but also bring them to the present. Because one of the things that we in the academic life always like to say is that lifelong learning is a part of our whole 
basis for existence. There's always something new to learn. And I think it behooves all of us not only to look at a lesson plan in particular by Fibonacci, but to look at some of the new lesson plans as well that involve modern day mathematicians and space experts. Frank Gargioni, our own uh, member of the commission, is, has been involved in NASA and space operations. So many of you, I'm sure, and your family members are involved in math, science, technology, and engineering. And what I think it is our responsibility is to encourage others to think about infusing this curriculum into their teaching, whether they're in kindergarten, or elementary school, secondary, or the collegiate sector. There's so much rich information that many of us don't know, that I don't know, in terms of the other lesson plans. And the integration of mathematics with history, with interdisciplinary activity, these are so much a part of what we would like to do, and so much that is the proud heritage that so many of us have inherited. And this commission has as its really heart and soul education. And as mentioned by the previous speakers, this is certainly something that is critical to the advancement of our society. And we're particularly pleased to have these wonderful young people with us who represent the future. And as was said earlier, we need to repeat this from time to time to encourage each new generation to be aware of their wonderful heritage that applies today. So I thank you so much, and uh, think positively when you think of mathematics, please. Thank you.